I'm gonna be honest and say I wasn't quite sure how to start this video. This was a series I've planned on covering for a while, but I didn't realize that when I finally did, we'd have lost an icon. Berserk is an incredibly powerful series for me, and clearly many others. As you can see the inspiration taken from it in characters like Cloud from Final Fantasy VII and the aesthetics of the Souls games. And none of this would have been possible without the love and dedication its creator, Kentaro Miura, had put into every single page. The world will not be the same without him. But it's clear he's affected so many people that even though he's gone, the story he's told still remains with us, and it will remain, without a doubt, one of the most influential series of all time. This is Berserk, and why I believe it's worth experiencing, especially now. Hi my friends, I'm Mike, and welcome to the Lion's Lounge. Today I'm going to walk you through the major highlights of Berserk. In particular, how its narrative is broken into three main parts. And for each part, I've made a cocktail that encapsulates my feelings about it. This video does have spoilers for the plot of Berserk, so if you're the type that likes to go in completely blind, my advice is to go and read it. Like, now. And then come back for the cocktails we're going to make. So the first question you may have is, how do I experience Berserk? Well, as I said, the series is essentially broken into three arcs. And one of them, the Golden Age arc, does have two anime adaptations. The 1997 series, and the three films from 2012 to 2013. Both are fine, but I'm a little partial to the 1997 series, as I feel it much better captures Miura's gritty style, and the character interactions have far more weight. Narratively, the manga starts a few years after this arc, up until our main character, Guts, encounters his former friend and now sworn enemy, Griffith, at which time the story takes us back to the beginning of Guts' life and the events that led to his quest for vengeance. Now, I am going to say here that the story of Berserk gets really dark. There's a lot of depictions not just of violence, but of sexual assault, especially in the earlier parts of the series. And this really holds true for this arc, with Guts' childhood, and the final parts during the eclipse that is really hard to get through. And Guts himself is not spared from this. He's a man who suffered immense cruelty and abuse since he was born, and has been fighting in battles for just as long, leading him to rely solely on himself and his strength, and pushing others away to protect himself from getting hurt. That is, until he meets the Band of the Hawk, a tight-knit group of mercenaries led by Griffith, a man of such eloquence and determination that even Guts is completely drawn in. This changes everything for him, as Guts forges bonds with the band and comes to truly admire Griffith, who in turn becomes attached to Guts, something he's never done as he's been fully focused on his goal of one day owning his own castle, and viewing those in his company more as subjects than friends, even his second-in-command, Casca. Casca is the only female member of the Band of the Hawk, but is greatly respected by the group and is one of its strongest fighters. She was one of the few individuals who was completely against Guts joining, as she finds his brash and headstrong behavior dangerous, but more so she's jealous. Jealous of the trust Griffith places in Guts almost immediately, and of how close the two seem to be. As it's made apparent, Casca harbors feelings for Griffith. This becomes more complicated when Guts decides he wants to leave the Band of the Hawk, to become strong on his own and one day be seen by Griffith as his equal, causing Griffith to break down and seduce the King's daughter, for which he's captured and tortured, and Casca is left to keep the Band of the Hawk together alone. Guts later returns and Casca blames everything that's happened on him, and as the two fight, they begin to understand each other and form a relationship deciding afterwards to battle alongside each other and rescue Griffith. Now, this last part is definitely spoilers for the end of this arc, so if you want to skip and go to the next part, I've left a time code in the description below where you can watch me make the cocktail. Guts, Casca, and the rest of the band of the Hawk succeed in freeing Griffith, but they find that during his captivity, he's been tortured beyond recognition and can barely even move by himself. 
it's disheartening for everyone. The Band of the Hawk, as they've essentially lost their strong leader, Guts and Casca, as the man they've idolized has been reduced to this broken shell, and Griffith, as he's not only lost his dream, but will never again have the means to achieve it, and will be a cripple for the rest of his life. All of this is what leads Griffith to use the power of his bayonet that he's carried since childhood, summoning and making a pact with the God Hand, wherein he will rise to their ranks in exchange for the lives of everyone he holds dear. The Band of the Hawk is branded and massacred by apostles of the God Hand, eventually leaving only Guts and Casca remaining. And despite Guts' struggle, he's held down and forced to witness Griffith assault Casca. Guts then breaking free and losing his eye and arm in the process. And with the help of the Skull Knight, they escape, but the cost of this battle has been too great. Guts's arm is replaced, but Casca's mind is shattered from the trauma, causing her to revert to a childlike mute state, one that she may never recover from. And it's here where the story really begins, as Guts turns all his rage and sorrow from this horrific event onto Griffith and the God Hand vowing to destroy them no matter what the cost. The Golden Age arc is one of the most popular parts of Berserk, and serves as the basis for the overall plot. And while there is a clear antagonist towards the end, it's not quite that simple. It's a brutal and tragic story, but one I highly encourage you to check out if you're at all interested in Berserk, as it's the most accessible part. Regardless, as Griffith's story is a huge part of this arc, I wanted to make a cocktail for him. This is based on a creamy cocktail called the Death Flip that is both powerful and eloquent, much like Griffith himself. So first, take a cocktail shaker and add one ounce or 30 milliliters of a Reposado tequila. Next, half an ounce or 15 milliliters of Jägermeister. Next, half an ounce or 15 milliliters of yellow chartreuse. This is a sweet herbal liqueur. Then just a bar spoon of simple syrup. And lastly, I know this is unconventional, but this cocktail calls for a whole egg. Not an egg white, not the yolk, the whole egg. Now, because we added an egg, we have to do a dry shake first. A dry shake is just without ice for about six to eight seconds. This is to emulsify the egg and make the drink silky smooth. Now add some ice and shake again for about 10 seconds. Then I'm gonna strain into a martini glass. And for garnish, I'm gonna grate some fresh nutmeg. And there you have my variation of the death flip, which I coined the Griffith. Cheers. Whew, yeah, that's very herbally. So it's not quite as overpowering as I thought it was gonna be, which I am <laughs> kind of happy about. I'm not a huge fan of Jaeger, which a lot of people aren't. So I was really curious how all these flavors would mesh together. But what I get out of this is sort of a creamy, herbally cocktail. The nutmeg is also a very good touch. It adds a little bit more spice to the drink and makes it a little bit more complex. It's very interesting. It kind of makes me think of a herbally eggnog. Even though there's no like milk in it, it has a creamy consistency because of the whole egg. And then there's some sweetness from the simple syrup and the reposado tequila that doesn't make it so, so one note. Is this something I could see myself drinking a lot of? Probably not. It's very rich and powerful. I could see myself making it occasionally after dinner because it feels like it's that type of cocktail. It's definitely a sipper. I don't think I could just have these back to back, but overall it's pretty good. Now that we've touched on the Golden Age arc, the next big part covers Guts's mission of revenge against Griffith and his eventual return to his corporeal form. This is mostly the conviction arc, but from my view, the world doesn't really change until the rise of Falconia. So for all intents and purposes, let's say this next part is the conviction and Millennium Falcon arcs. While Guts initially meets the elf Puck, and later the young thief Isidro, who continue to follow him, he is still behaving as though he's very much alone, going from village to village, killing apostles, and refusing to get close to anyone again to prevent further emotional turmoil. Eventually though, he encounters Farnese and Serpico, part of the Holy See, who view Guts as a threat, until their eyes are opened by the horrors their religion was inflicting upon the world, and the true terror of the apostles. These events serve as a precursor to the true climax of this arc, as a pseudo-eclipse occurs in which the demon child, 
the corrupted offspring of Guts and Casca, is consumed by the Apostle, the egg of the perfect world, to become the new physical host for Griffith, now reborn into our world. And despite Guts' intent to destroy Griffith once and for all, the latter has no interest in Guts, and forms a new Band of the Hawk made of Apostles to begin preparations for a future battle against the massive Kushan Empire. Farnese and Serbico join back up with Guts, Puck, Isidro, and Casca, and together they intend to travel to Puck's homeland in the hopes of retrieving Casca's lost memories. Along the way, they reach the forest of the Spirit Tree and meet the young witch Shirke, whose master predicted Guts' and Casca's arrival, and offers Guts the Berserker armor with which to combat members of the reborn Band of the Hawk seeking to kill him. The armor greatly augments Guts' physical strength, and temporarily dulls pain he experiences in battle, but at the cost of his sanity. If he loses himself to it, he becomes as the name of the armor suggests, a berserker that will attack friend and foe alike until his death. Only with the help of Shirke is Guts able to overcome the armor's hold, and with her master's aid, escape the forest with his group. After the battle with Guts, the Band of the Hawk reconvene, and led by Griffith, they wage an assault against the Kushan Empire, ruled by the incredibly powerful apostle Ganishka, who soon learns that his strength pales in comparison to Griffith. Ganishka then uses a man-made bailet to reincarnate once again into a near godlike state in the hopes of defeating Griffith, but what he doesn't realize is this is all part of the God Hand's plan. Griffith, as Femto, ascends to Ganishka's head, and from there appears the Skull Knight with his dimensional sword, attempting to kill Griffith, only for the latter to redirect the blow at Ganishka and open a tear into the astral world, causing a merger between it and the physical one, with creatures of myth spilling out and the city of Falconia rising from the void. Ganishka perishes, and Griffith declares himself ruler of Falconia, a capital he intends to make a utopia for all of mankind. Now, there is more to the story after this, but I feel here is an appropriate point to pause and make my next cocktail. And it's one I've actually made outside this channel. This one is for Guts, as it's through these arcs that you really see him grow as a character, and, well, struggle against the Apostles, but also his own rage and self-isolation. And he eventually learns to let people in to help him carry this heavy burden. This is why I've named the cocktail The Struggler. So to make this drink, take a cocktail shaker and add one full ounce or 30 milliliters of Angostura bitters. Typically, I know that you only add a dash or so of Angostura bitters, but this one calls for a full ounce. Then one ounce or 30 milliliters of lime juice. Next, an ounce or 30 milliliters of a Navy Strength rum. I'm using Smith & Cross, which is a Jamaican rum. And lastly, an ounce and a half or 45 milliliters of Orgeau. Add some ice and shake for 12 seconds. Then strain into a Nick & Nora glass. And for garnish, I'm gonna use this Skull Pick and two Maraschino cherries. And there you have the Struggler. Cheers. An incredibly powerful cocktail. If you've never made a drink that has Angostura bitters as a huge component of it, I recommend you try this. It may be overwhelming for a lot of people as those bitters are very present, but this is also why you need to use a Navy Strength rum so that it's able to keep up with the power of those bitters. You don't really get the Orgeau as much, it kind of just adds a little bit of sweetness and then the Lemon juice helps balance it out a little bit with some tartness. This is another cocktail I couldn't drink a lot of because it's very high proof, it's really strong. This is a sipper, so you're gonna be, you're gonna be drinking this for a while. But I think I did a pretty decent job making a cocktail that did guts justice. Now finally we come to the last main part of Berserk, where we follow the events after the astral and physical planes have merged, the Fantasia arc. Here we cycle back and forth between Guts's group and Griffith. Guts continues his journey to Elfheim, Puck's homeland, where they must travel across a vast ocean. And so they charter a boat with a sea captain, Roderick, Farnese's fiance. And along their journey, they battle a ghost ship led by a seemingly undead pirate crew and pick up a new ally in Isma, a young mermaid who warns them of an old threat on the sea once sealed away and now free the Sea God. 
Guts and his crew battle the massive creature, and eventually defeat it and the ghost crew and finally make it to Elfheim. Meanwhile, Falconia has become a haven for humans, as the rest of the world is overrun with creatures originally from the astral plane, and Griffith is more or less viewed as a god by his people and their sole protector, with help from the church elevating his status. He reunites with the princess of the Midland Kingdom, and with her support, his rule is more or less assured. Back in Elfheim, Shirke and Farnese dive into Casca's mind, in the hopes of repairing it, and with a great deal of effort, they succeed and she awakens, seemingly to a state before the eclipse, appearing to not have any knowledge of it. When she sees Guts though, it all comes rushing back, and she passes out again. Guts left feeling hopeless that Casca will never move past this, so much so that he questions what he should be doing with his life going forward. And this is essentially where the story ends. But in a way, I think that's okay. Guts has a conversation with the Skull Knight, who tells him that he can end his journey. He's accomplished a huge goal in restoring Casca, and in moving beyond the events of the Eclipse to forge new bonds and begin to trust people again. Guts has struggled, more than any person should, and perhaps he no longer needs to. Killing Griffith at this point would not accomplish anything. The astral and physical planes have already merged, and Falconia is now heading towards the utopia that Griffith dreamed of. I don't know where Miura would have attempted to take the story of Berserk if it had continued. I don't know how much longer it would have been. I don't know if Guts would have chosen to continue his quest of vengeance despite everything he's been through. But I think it's fine not to know. Not every story needs a firm conclusion, and even though Berserk doesn't have one, it's worth experiencing. It's a dark story where terrible things happen to good people. But what I can say is that it doesn't wallow in that misery. It's a story about the struggle, and finding the strength, even when it feels impossible, to move past the pain in the hopes of a brighter future. And it's for this reason that Berserk is one of my favorite series of all time. And I hope if you haven't read it, this has, in some small way, convinced you to give it a shot. While I was writing the script for this video, I could already feel how massive in scope it was growing. But I knew I wouldn't be satisfied with anything less. And so finally, my last cocktail is a tribute to this series now that it has finally come to its end. This is a variation to a cocktail called The Last Word, which I've dubbed The Journey's End. The Last Word and its variations are all four-part cocktails of equal parts, and this is no different. To start, take a cocktail shaker and add 3 quarters of an ounce or 22.5 milliliters of lemon juice. Next, 3 quarters of an ounce or 22.5 milliliters of a rye whiskey. I recommend you choose one that's 100 proof so it can keep up with the rest of these ingredients. Then 3 quarters of an ounce or 22.5 milliliters of Amaro di Angostura. This is another herbal liqueur. And finally, 3 quarters of an ounce or 22.5 milliliters of Benedictine. Add some ice and shake for 12 seconds. Then strain into a coupe. And like the previous cocktail, I'm going to garnish this with two maraschino cherries. And there you have the journey's end. Cheers. This is by far my favorite cocktail out of the ones I've made today. When I was initially making this recipe, I wasn't quite sure how the Benedictine would interact with the Amaro and the rye whiskey, but I was surprised to find that the herbal notes do not overpower the rest of these ingredients. I already knew that Amaro and bourbon or rye whiskey go well together, and then lemon juice is typically a common component with that. What I didn't know was, how would the Benedictine play into that formula? And after I first made it, I was surprised to find that it's still very sweet and you still get those spicy rye notes, but then you get sort of an herbal undertone that's very pleasant. But overall, I'm very happy with this cocktail. I knew I wanted to do some kind of variation on the last word, and I'm happy to find that the ingredients that I chose just worked the first time. So today we dove headfirst into Berserk and made three cocktails inspired by it. This was a monster of a video and much bigger than anything I've ever done before. But I hope that you enjoyed it, and if you did, I'd really appreciate it if you'd like or subscribe. If you have any cocktails you'd like me to make based on your favorite series, let me know in the comments below. If you want to see what I make outside this channel, follow me on Twitter at MrSpaceLion or Instagram at Mr.SpaceLion. But friends, thank you so much for stopping by the Lion's Lounge. I've been your bartender, Mike, and I hope to see you next time.